Good morning, Rich. Good morning. How you all? Yeah, no, that's the one we, we had in seminar, similar one for that. Yes, yeah. yeah. I love it. They I love the whole. Uh -huh. Yeah. You and I may be the only Brady bunch yeah. of people here today. So, so uh, a lot of them in the house. Today, but Bibles go annotate, paraphrase. Can they have a noisy bunch. Okay, 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 okay. All stacked on one shelf oh, in the yeah. bookcase. They have a noisy <laughs> bunch. <laughs> and I said, I'll, I'll try them all. I ended up with a paraphrase one because I like, I like that. Like the, uh, well, you'll have, if, you, if you get this book, you'll even have another one, another translation to go with. And another translation. <laughs> uh, Greek. Well, uh, it's English. It is English. It's, it's okay. English. It's British, maybe. British. <laughs> the, the thing that I sat there thinking about was we know that we're all human beings, and when the whoever annotated it or paraphrased it or wrote the King James Version or whatever. Did it in context to the world around them at that time? Exactly. Yeah. You know. This well, to a to a point. To a point, but I mean, they yeah, I mean, to the, to the linguistic yeah and middle so road, like, right? You know, and we we know that the original manuscripts of this were in Greek and translated and everything like that. I'm more like. You know, we, 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 we get, we, there are so many possibilities of human values or human perspectives coming in. <laughs> I'm going like, whoa. That's true. And, of course, we don't have the original, we don't have the original. Of, any, of any letter. We've got thousands of copies of Romans or this, you know, and how do we sort through all of those and the variations in those. I mean, the, the academic pursuit of the, the true first letter is, is futile. Yeah, and so it would give you know, something that I'm going like, those, hmm. those letters were written before Windows 10. Especially, especially <laughs> in the environment we live in, where I can punch in Colossians on the computer, and here's within. Okay, so that's probably the NRSV. The the New Oxford people usually do that translation. Rich? It's a study Bible. <laughs> well, I was raised on King James, but but uh, switched to the uh, New Standard Revised Version because I was told that that was the standard for the Episcopal Church, and that that, that was the one. But when I look at the uh, excerpts in the uh, prayer book, they don't seem to come from the uh, NSRV. And so I, I, that was a little question I had. Uh, but now I'm using right. the, the NSRV that's written in uh, Cajun French. <laughs> how, about you, how about you, Collins? Uh, I use my uh, phone with the various different translations depending um. on the, uh, the circumstances. Uh, I like King James, but it is a little stilted. Yeah. I like NIV, uh, kind of as a second backup. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Margaret, how about you? Uh, new Revised Standard. All right. Sharon Amazing. New Revised Standard. Okay. New, new Revised Standard with the Apocrypha, extra large print. <laughs> you didn't have to tell him that. Huh? <laughs> you know. What about you, Barb? NIV. Okay. Laura? New Revised Standard. Uh huh. Lawson? Uh, Oxford Study uh, and also Life Application Bible. Okay. Like Ginger? I have the New Revised and also the Harper Study Bible. All right. Well, that Harper's, any of those study Bibles have a translation. Those usually aren't the translations, but they've got study that goes with them. Helen, how about you? I've got the new Oxford Annotated Bible with the NRV. Yeah. 
NRSV. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, to your point, Rich, and as we talk about translations and Bibles and things like that, the the two most frequently read in church on Sundays are the NRSV and the NIV. And we have as a denomination certain Bibles that are sanctioned to be used in worship. And other ones then cannot be used in worship because they don't meet the academic credentials or the linguistic credentials. And that's usually a combination of that. So, for example, one recent translation by another scholar, Eugene Peterson, called The Message, which puts it in, in very sort of vernacular terms, is not allowed to be read in church on Sundays because it, it, it is too far afield from the academic translation of the Bible itself. So we're really in, in church trying to keep it academically pure, but also understandable um, into when it's being read out loud or seen in print and those kind of things. So let me, as we get into the Bible study, let me just ask you a couple other questions about the Bible. See what you Mary has, Mary. Oh, sorry. Yes, Mary, go ahead. I just want to say that for a study Bible, this is just amazing. It's a King James study Bible, second edition. And before you get into anything, it gives you kind of a summary thing. And then this is the whole Old Testament. And then you get to the summary of Genesis. And then you get into the pages and it gives you a long explanation about what you've just read as a study idea. And it's not great. Yes. Blessing in yeah. Work. And, and there, there are very ways to do that. that. They'll have you reflect on certain parts of it. They'll tell you the theme. So it's some people really like the study Bible because it gives them a little extra guidance sitting alone at home. And that's good. Some people just like to read it pure and let the Holy Spirit work through them. And all those are all those are fine. So a couple questions about the Bible. Uh, Morris found his. All right. The Living Bible paraphrase, large print edition. All right. Another large print edition here from Morris. That's good. That's good. The, li the Living Bible. Good. All right. So in terms of the New Testament in particular, when was the New Testament canon finalized? to establish this is what the Bible is as much as this is what the Bible is not. Jerome did a translation into Latin, but this, that was a little bit later in time than this one. Sometime probably what we would call second century Fourth century AD. Well, that was Jerome. No, Jerome is even later than that. So 367 AD. So when you think about a Bible, we're used to having something to hold in our hands. Was that the council? Before that, was that the council? No, it was not. No, it was not. When you think about the Bible that we hold, before it was scrolls or letters. And you might have, of the 27, you might have... 13 of this you might have whatever else and they were all around and it became more of a codex a collection like you'd have a notebook you'd open it put it in but then some people would have this thing called the gospel of thomas or they would have this other letter all these other type of things and people are saying no 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 how did you how did that get in there that shouldn't be in there that shouldn't be in there and so the, the church through the spirit and probably some political maneuvering as well to be honest <laughs> decided okay here are these these will be the books of the new testament but think about that, 387, 350 years after the resurrection. 387. Three, I'm sorry, 367, 367 AD. So 330 some odd years after the resurrection. The I was there. Books as we do in their Bible. You aware of that? I'm not, which ones are those? Well, they have the Apocrypha. They have, how they handle the Apocrypha is a little bit different than ours. We, the new revised version has the Apocrypha in there. And it, if you think of Old Testament, New Testament, then Apocrypha is just below it in Episcopal thinking. I guess Catholic thinking, they're saying it's, it's equal to all that. We're saying theologically, spiritually, it's not equal. It's important to know because it's that sort of a 400-year period. 200 years before Christ to 200 years after Christ of what's going on in the Jewish world. But in terms of the, the Bible itself, um, the Old Testament, the New Testament, and, and we read from the Apocrypha from, from time to time in, 
in our lectionary and things like that. So here's the other, another question about the Bible. What order are the books in the New Testament in? How have they been organized? After the gospel, which was the biggest down to the littlest. That's right. So this is not chronology. This is not based on when it was, what year we think it was written. So the gospels are first, and then Acts, which is longest, and follows the gospel narrative in the sense sequentially. That sort of makes sense. But then Romans, first and second Corinthians, all those things that go on are have to do with the size of the letter. Oh. And when it what's in what's we we'll call the Pauline corpus, what has been ascribed to Paul, or Paul and Timothy and co-authors like Colossians is today. So just as uh, just as a note, when you're reading the Bible, you're not reading something in chronological order a lot of the time in, in terms of those books. So here's another fun question. When did chapters and verses come into use in the Bible? Ooh. Like John 3.16. I don't know. By 1560. 1560. It was and and when it was printed in various languages. Up until that point, up through the Reformation, the Catholic Church had a stronghold on the Latin translation of that. And it was punishable by death to translate the Bible into one's own language. <laughs> and when the Reformation happened and when the printing press happened, if you were trying to compare the French John 3.16 to the English John 3.16, that was one of the reasons. So just think about it. things like that we think, just take for granted. Not even in the first version of the Bible were there chapters and verses that way. Because a lot of those even were academically prescribed. And when true academics get into it, they say, they shouldn't have started this chapter here. They should have started here or there. And there's all kinds of arguments that goes in with that. But this is part of Know Your Bible. Hmm. That some of this stuff came much later in life together. I was going to point out chapter four. The first verse should have gone at the end of chapter three. Right. And why they did that, we'd have to look back and yep. see. That will probably not be something we cover in this class unless you go home and do the research yep. and bring right. it back and bring it back to the class. Or, or Collins will give you that homework. Why is it, why is it that way? <laughs> So the, the language of most of the New Testament books is, is Greek, written in Greek. A few little things in Hebrew may be thrown in, a few little things in Aramaic sometimes thrown in, but mostly that was just an aside where it was written in Greek, then it went to Latin, and then it started going into a variety of, of languages. And as we were talking about before the class began, we do not have the original letter to the Colossians. And as we'll talk about here in a second, in a number of these letters, like to Corinthians or Colossians, Paul references another letter. Read the letter from Laodicea. We don't have the letter from Laodicea. Why did that get, did they not like it? And so they ripped it up. Did it never get trans? Who knows what happened to it? And again, some scholar might be able to tell us, but there are a number of letters that Paul wrote that we don't have our hands on. Um, and so that's one of the things to figure out. Where, where was Paul when he wrote the letter? Um, we think for this letter, um, N.T. Wright thinks that he was in Ephesus. Many scholars also think that he was in Rome, because those are the two places. Those are the two places he was in prison for a long time, and we know he is in chains, um, as he says in this letter. Rob, are you going to overlook the? of the assumption that Paul was the writer and not- We're getting there, we're getting there. <laughs> getting there. So I wanna, I wanna talk about the word gospel for a second. We're, we're used to hearing the gospel of Matthew, the gospel of Mark, gospel of John, gospel of Luke, and that, those, that word gospel being attributed to that. Paul also uses the word gospel. And I would say this is probably little g gospel. Uh, and one of the things I like about this book actually is in the back, 
there is a glossary. So if you have the book and you want to look at the glossary, we're going to look at this term gospel for just a second and how <clears throat> he tries to define it um, for us. Rob. Or, uh, book. Yes. Uh, Excuse me. Yes, Sharon. I'm trying to buy the um, the book online, could, but the name of it is not on our website. Could you tell me the name? Okay. One the yes. It is Paul for Everyone. Okay. The Thank Prison you. Letters. Thank you. Paul the Prison Letters. Hmm? That's the book. Paul the by N. T. Wright. Okay. Uh, that would be nice to send to him. Hmm. Hmm. Thank you. All right. So I'm just going to read to you from the, the glossary here. Um, good news and gospel essentially mean the same thing. It's the idea of good news or gospel for which an older English word gospel had two principal meaning for the first century Jews. First, with roots in Isaiah, it meant the news of Yahweh's long-awaited victory. And actually, part of the word for gospel comes from the Greek euangelion. When there is a victory on the battlefield, 10 miles off, and somebody comes back to share, it's good news. It was euangelion. Here is the news of the victory on the battlefield. So we think, and Paul uses that victory language a lot in talking about the victory over sin and death and the ultimate triumph of Christ. So there, that's some of that. But that's also tied back to Isaiah. Um, second, it was used in the Roman world of accession or birthday or the emperor. Since for Jesus and Paul, the announcement of God's inbreaking kingdom was both the fulfillment of prophecy and a challenge to the world's present rulers, gospel became an important shorthand for both the message of Jesus himself and of the apostolic message about him. Paul saw this message as itself a vehicle of God's saving power. So then what we have in the Bible are the four canonical gospels. Mark even starts this out, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. When Paul talks about good news, he is not referencing the chronological life of Jesus in the way the gospelers did. He is talking about the good news that's really most tied into the crucifixion resurrection event. He doesn't quote Jesus very much, if at all, where there are plenty of opportunities for him to have quoted something about love your neighbor as yourself, or as our Lord said. <clears throat> doesn't matter about it being written. It was in the oral corpus of things. The, pe the stories of Jesus and what he had said were still going around. And some things were written down. There were collections of Jesus saying, as we try to trace how the Bible was put together, there are some of those things. Paul would have known those things, particularly as he interacted with Peter and other people who knew Jesus personally. He had every opportunity to. And one of the things I put my hands on my hips about is to say, why didn't you? This was the perfect opportunity to quote something Jesus said. So Paul, in the end, is not so concerned about what Jesus said, but about what God did through Jesus Christ. Wait a minute, say that in again. Incarnation, resurrection, from incarnation to, to resurrection. And that's part of what he's what the outline is here in what we've got going on. So that word gospel, some people even say Paul's letters is a fifth gospel because it has a different tone about it. Just like Matthew, Mark, and Luke, those three Gospels are what's called in the synoptic tradition. They're synonymous with each other in the sense that they trace a chronology. John's does trace Jesus' life, but it's a different cycle. If you were to compare the Gospel of Matthew chronologically with the Gospel of John, it will drive you crazy. And it will cause you a lot of academic questions to saying, why are these timetables out of sync? For example, the beginning of the Gospel of John is Jesus coming into the temple and turning the tables over. In other Gospels, that doesn't happen to near the end. And on and on and on and on. So there are a lot of scholarly questions that come up with this Bible study that we, that we have. Let me stop for there, a second there and see if anybody 
here in the room has a question or online. If you have one online, raise your hand. Happy to answer a question if I can, okay? The room. Um, the Greek translation of that is euangelion. And don't ask me to spell that for you. I can remember the word, um, but it is it's actually just the uh, made it into English with all the Greek letters, but it is the, the announcement of victory on the battlefield is what euangelion is. Now, does Paul use, I'd, I'd have to really know the Greek to know if every time Paul uses the word gospel, his, it is that translation euangelion. I know it's frequent enough that that's been ascribed to what we call good news. John. There's <clears throat> another idiosyncrasy when they, they came up with the titles in the book. Um, to be considered a gospel, there was a certain literary construct that it had to follow. And of course, Paul's letters don't follow that. So that's why they separated that one. Mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. separated. Right. And that's a good point. And, and to the other point, too, the preponderance of how this good news was shared was orally, yeah. verbally. There weren't a lot of literate people. Finding something to write on was not easy like it is now. So you are passing along the message by ear. In Paul's missionary journeys, which we're going to talk about here in a second, he's going in to Athens. He's going into Rome. He's going into Philippi, and he's preaching in the marketplace. He's Spreading the news that way. So the preponderance is verbal in the first place. I have a question. Yes, Kate. Um, when we have, like in the Old Testament, like you, I'm just trying to figure out how they got permission. We have the Old Testament. You have like the P writer, J writers, and all those things that have been put there, right? Okay, so then now when you get to the New Testament, who decided then what would be put in there and what what I mean that was written in Greek is a little funny to me, but who what conference or what group of people decided? That's a very good question. The there the the 367 date that I gave was a scholar on behalf of the church saying he was asked, what's the list? And he gave a list, and that list became more of a common practice kind of list for people to use. The J, D, E, and P was a, in the Old Testament, people having these different versions of Genesis or creation and putting them in together, weaving them in as one. So that's a completely different way of constructing, and again, theoretical Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and all of those type of things. The J, E, D, and P doesn't apply to First and Second Kings, for example, it doesn't apply to some of that other, some of that other part. But 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 most of these letters, then there are you know, a hundred, two hundred copies of them, and we try to put them together. But that's not redacting them in the same way as just checking things for accuracy. Okay. And that's where we were talking before about footnotes in Bibles. So if you're reading something, sometimes in a footnote it'll say. Other translations read this word. And that's usually, say, you've got 50 letters and 35 of them say this and 15 say this. Well, that 15 is enough to say that's not just an outlier translation. There's a, a, enough in that percentage that we're going to have to add that. If it's just one of those 50, eh, probably that was a scribe who made a mistake or somebody who was trying to put something in or who knows what it is but it's not statistically and academically enough reason to even provide a footnote to say that other translations say this or that. Who decided it was okay is what I'm trying to... Wasn't there I'm, a council that met to canonize, to decide what was canonized? I think there was. I know Jamnia in the year 200 was the council that decided the Old Testament, but that was a Jewish council. Yeah. I'll have to, we'll have to look and see. Maybe someone there who's got a computer okay. out can, can Google that for us as we sit here to say if there was finally a, a council that said, this is the one. Lawson has it. 
I think it was the Council of Rome in 382. Okay, Council, I'll go with you. I, I, Council of Rome in 382. So 360, 367 was when the first scholar said, okay, here they are. And it took that long, another, whatever, 15 years for the church to agree to it and vote on it to say, yes, this is the, this is the Bible. Thank you. Rob, there were uh, two earlier councils. One was in Hippo. Uh, and that was the earliest that had, had adopted that list of that bishop. And uh, then following the uh, Council of Hippo, there was, a, uh, th there was another one that uh, reaffirmed, if you will, that uh, division of the New Testament. Now, the, it wasn't until the Geneva Bible that the English Bible I had both in the new and the old, the King James, uh, I mean, the uh, uh, verses the, and, and the chapters. Rob, Thank you. Rob? Yes. Uh, why, why was Paul in prison? What had he done to get himself? He was a he was arrested for disturbing the peace and, and preaching that crazy Christian stuff. Uh, they threw him in prison for years for, for that? They did. And, and, uh, they did. Uh, why, why would the, the people in Turkey be opposed? I mean, I can understand why the people in Jerusalem would be opposed to that because it was in direct conflict with, with the Jewish religion. But mm. I, can't, I, I don't understand why it would be such a such a, an grievous uh, uh, thing to have up in up in Turkey. There was a lot of right. recidivism. He kept doing it. Recidivism. Recidivism. Right. Well, the, if, if if you read through <laughs> Acts of the Apostles, which Doug Bischoff took us through very well a couple years ago, part of it is like when he goes into a place like Philippi, and he casts out the demons from this person. Um, who was a fortune teller, was a slave, and these fortune tellers, they lost their ability to make money. They made a complaint to the magistrates, and so that got Paul at least thrown into prison and beaten for a short time. So there are all types of reasons that people would, would say, would, would take Paul and everybody in front of the magistrates. Um, they, were preaching also... things against the, they were preaching things against the emperor. Here's another king. And he's sort of making it up. It's sort of a spin of saying, well, you, there's only one king, it's the emperor, and we can't have Jesus the king, so you're preaching against the emperor, so you get thrown into prison. It's that kind of stuff. It's against the government that's in control of the time, right? I mean, like he was, so you can yeah, or the, the, say or, stuff out loud then about the government that's in control. Right, or just local magistrates and local local harmony, not even Roman stuff, but just local stuff. P but Paul and his cohorts were used to getting arrested, you know, much like folks, I guess, in the in the civil rights movement. You knew that it was coming when you were going to go down there and and do something and and protest at a lunch counter or march or somewhere else that you were you were going you were swimming upstream and going against the cultural current. During and Paul. Stirring up this, trouble. Stirring up trouble. That's right. Stirring up trouble. Good trouble. All right. So let's talk a little bit. Again, this is the in the introduction to the whole letter. Let's talk a little bit about the place, Colossae. And in your book, uh, in the front of the book, if you have it or if you can call it up on Google, a map of what is present day Turkey. So a couple things to say about present day Turkey. This is also Paul's homeland. His, and I, I can hold this up to the screen here. Can I do that? Yeah, I can show that up there. You can see down over here is Tarsus, which is Paul's hometown. He was not born in what we call Israel or Syria or any place like that. He was born in, in Asia Minor in Tarsus which is about 430 miles from Colossae. And just like we have interstates and well-traveled roads, so too the trade routes that went to Greek and other places like that 
went through towns like Colossae. And part of what happened at, at one point in history is that Colossae was a much larger town. Let's say like Detroit used to be this big town, thriving town. Economic things change and Detroit is no longer the town that it was, but it's still pretty good. Or like in the state of Georgia, Savannah had been the capital, but when it became Atlanta, things changed, or even Milledgeville. Still important towns, but things are different. So that's where we are with Colossae. It's, it's not quite the significant town. There are other towns around there, which he references, that have become a little more important in terms of trade and industry and all those other kinds of things, but it's still right there on the road. So it's easy to see how come going up and down that road with all the travels, Christianity can make it to a town like that. Thank you. My reading of the of the and it starts out. It appears to me that Paul did not teach in Colossae, but one of his one of his Correct. personal followers, uh, the Epaphras. Right. That's right. Was the one that taught him. And he's just sort of backing up his decide his little his student, you know. He, That's correct. That's hey, correct. You got my, you got you're getting my, you're getting ahead of me here, but yeah, we're just talking about the place right now. This right. this that's fine, but you're right. You're right on that. Um, and so another thing that happened that's interesting because you wonder if he's in a synagogue, how did Judaism get to this place? And one of the emperors, Antiochus the Third, about two hundred years before this resettled 2,000 Jewish families to this area. Hmm. Part of what you do when you conquer a place, if they're unruly, is you relocate them, like the Babylonian exile. We're going to take the Jews and the Jewish leaders over here, and that we're going to, they're going to be under our watchful eye. We're going to disperse them. And that in, in academic circles is also known as the diaspora. Sometimes that's voluntary. People decide to move away, but sometimes it is foisted upon them. And to move Jews out um, has actually been a long history of that, as you may well know, about how Jews get to certain places throughout the world, which led to the Holocaust and everything that sort of came after that as well. I, I, Rob, I noticed when, when I looked up Colossae this morning that Man, there's nothing there now. It's just out. Of, uh, looks like a, a spot in the middle of the desert. Looks like I wonder what happened to the what what whatever what, whatever was the economic force driving that city must have dried up because there's there's people are gone. There's nothing there but but dust. Well, well, let me tell you what happened. Earthquake, sixty one to sixty two A.D. And this whole region, and we discovered that on our trip to Greece when we went on the church pilgrimage, that earthquakes are a regular occurrence, and they often disrupt things where the city has to be abandoned, and everybody moves a couple miles out or a couple miles somewhere else, and they redo the city because you can't even rebuild there because things are too, too unstable. And so that's one of the things that scholars look back to say the earthquake probably had the, the biggest effect on that. Maybe the same in our time when a hurricane comes through South Carolina, Louisiana, a town is wiped out and the people just say, forget it. We're going we're gonna to leave and go somewhere else. So they, they had too much on their plate. Oh, no more. <clears throat> yes. Tectonic plates. Yes, I follow you. Thank you, Rich. Very good. Very good. That was for Collins, actually. <laughs> And, uh, and, to, and to Sankey's point, uh, there is no evidence in the letter or in Acts of the Apostles that Paul or Timothy ever visited there. And particularly you if you're in jail and you want to get the message somewhere and you want to back up a student, a disciple, or if you think of a bishop trying to support a priest in that kind of thing, an overseer, you send a letter. And you send that person with a letter. That person comes to you. I'm guessing sort of this is what happened as I look back at the letter. Epaphras is having a hard time. I've got this guy who's teaching this other false, but they're teaching something here. I don't know what to do. It's messing up everything. It's, it's, it's blending religion. It's, it's keeping us from having a true way of worshiping. What do I do? 
Well, I'll tell you what, I'll write a letter and you can take it and that'll help explain it. And maybe that'll give you the support that you need. So yeah, I think that's really part of what's, what's happening here with all that. So authorship, again, let's talk about authorship. The letter itself, chapter one, verse one says, Paul, a disciple of Christ and Timothy are my faithful brother. So that verbiage, and I got to turn to it here on this right page again. That verbiage um, is when he says, my brother is in a sense saying that Paul is the one actually writing out the letter. Now, some people wonder if Paul really wrote out the letter with his own hand and own vocabulary and own linguistic style because it seems to be very different than Romans or very different than Galatians. When people really look back at the language and all those things that are used, there are a lot of variations. For example, um, 34 words appear in this letter that appear nowhere else in the New Testament. That's odd. Maybe he picked up some new words in jail. That happens, he picked up some new words in jail. Um, we don't know. Um, there are many synonyms, and he, he says, which is, which is, which is. You know, some people just always, they say something, and on and on, you know, and you know, that's their personal little phrase. There's this little which is phrase, which happens a lot in this letter, which doesn't happen in other letters. That gives scholars some wonderment. Was Paul speaking it, and Timothy was writing it with his hands? Did Paul say, hey, Timothy... You got to send this letter over here. I don't have time for this. Would you write it, please? And you know what we've talked about. This is what I want you to say. Boom, boom, boom. Would you write it out and send it? This is not the only letter in the New Testament that is co-authored. Sometimes it's Paul and Timothy. Sometimes it's Paul, Timothy, and Silas. So it is, it is nothing new under the sun. Some scholars even think this letter may have come posthumously. That a disciple of Paul's wrote it after Paul had been martyred. In Paul's thought, in Paul's teaching, and this was a more common custom then than it would be now. We, we wouldn't write letters for each other after each other had died, unless we were trying to get away with some. But this, is, this type of discipleship did not involve that kind of thing. So scholars have some differing opinions on that. All of that doesn't change the fact that it's in the Bible. All of that doesn't change the fact that people saw spiritual wisdom and truth in what was written here for those 330 years to have it placed in the Bible itself. The validity is not just about the authorship. The validity is about the truth contained in there because the spirit is involved in the writing, in the transmission, in the hearing. And so that's how we understand all of this to have happened for us in our time together. But the letter itself says Paul and Timothy. Sometimes scholars just then end up saying the writer instead of saying Paul wrote this or whatever wrote this, the writer. And in church, sometimes we say a reading from Paul's letter to the Colossians, and sometimes we just say a reading from the letter to the Colossians. And that's okay too. Um, uh, other things that make people wonder, there are many times where Paul refers to the Holy Spirit that doesn't happen so much in this. There are many times that Paul refers to the end of times when Jesus shall come again. That doesn't happen so much in this letter. So if it's written from Ephesus or Rome, all those themes are in the other letters when those are coming. So what is it about this particular letter? It's short. Maybe he's in a hurry. He wasn't going to spend all this time. He just whipped it out and sent it on its way. Maybe the letter that went to Laodicea that disappeared had all that in it. So he said, all right, you get that. Y'all swap it and it's fine because, you know, we're just trying to be efficient about how we get the, the word out to everybody. Yep. Also, no promise to come and see. When he's writing to the Romans, he's saying, I'm on the way. I'm coming to see you. I'm coming there. I'm going to, when I get there, I'm going to do this myself. None of that for Colossians. He never seems to intend even to go there except for in spirit through the content of this letter. 
he does say he may send some others at the, in chapter four, but it never says that he is coming in that way. Um, so again, as we've talked about, some people think it was written from Ephesus, which is also an Asian minor, all the way over on the tip of Asia Minor on the Mediterranean. If you've been on a cruise in the Mediterranean, you can get off there and go buy a rug and go see Ephesus and all those other kind of things when you're there. Um, it's wonderful. But it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's very, very close to the, the sea in that way. Some say it was written from Rome, a longer imprisonment, which then he was freed from Rome. He made it back to Jerusalem, arrested again, and was on a ship and came back and then arrested again. So let's talk a little bit about Paul and his missionary journeys again at, at, on this backdrop. Paul himself, we think, was born around 6 AD. Uh, he had his conversion made around 33 AD, maybe 30. And from 60 to 62, after all these missionary journeys, he was on house arrest in Rome. House churches, house arrests, there weren't a lot of buildings, a lot of prisons. Some places there were, like Philippi, we saw a prison in Philippi, basically just a cave that wasn't too deep that you could put bars across and, and throw people in there. Um, and we believe in 64 or 67, he was martyred, that he was killed. We don't have that exact date either. But on the way, he was sent out by the church to share the good news. He and Barnabas went on the first missionary journey in about the year 47 or 48, going through this area, Galatia, his hometown and a region. Galatia is not a town like Colossae is. Galatia is like the state of North Carolina or the state of Georgia. It's a region that's there. The second missionary journey came soon after. But it was longer, 49 to 52. And in that one, he made it actually from Asia Minor into Europe for the first time into Greece. His third missionary journey is a return to some of those places he had been, 52 to 57. And he has a long stay in Ephesus during that time. Uh, and just to let you know, 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament are traditionally and academically attributed to Paul. 13, 13 of, the of the 27 are attributed to Paul. The other ones, the Gospels. Revelation, three Johns, James, all those other ones have different authors. Hebrews is really a toss-up. In this letter, you at least have someone saying, I, Paul, am writing this letter. In Hebrews, you don't. You don't get any of that. So let me stop right there and see if you have any questions. Okay, you have a question? You're just holding up the book. Okay, all right. I wasn't sure if they were raising it. Thank you. Um, you said the church sent him on missionary journeys. I heard. Of yes. Thoughts. Yeah. And I'm sitting here thinking, I think in Paul recommended that he go on a missionary journey and church in Jerusalem said, yeah. Yeah, get, <laughs> get out of here. Well, it's actually the church in Antioch that sent them on those journeys. The, the church in Antioch. Yes, the church in Antioch. They may have. Like, they right. may have said, no, yeah. why don't you go there, Paul? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions of people online? Okay. So let's talk about dating. It's impossible to date the letters. When I was in school, one of the first things you did on a letter was to say, dear such and such, and then you go over to the right-hand side and you put a date, you know, June 4th, June 3rd, whatever else it is. And so at least someone would have an, that was not the custom. Dating was different, understanding things were different uh, and all of that. We're guessing around the year 60, this letter was written. And it was probably um, in the middle of all the different letters he wrote, but maybe towards the middle and towards the end. Some people say Galatians was the first letter. Some people think Thessalonians was the first letter. We're not quite sure of, of the ones we have, the ones written, but the year 60 would have is a guess from that. Same type of year as Ephes Ephesians was written and Philemon was written. So same type of time. 
Alma, you raise your hand. I saw this. Okay. You, so when did they? I'm not when did they change it? So maybe they didn't know the date. When did they put the date as the terrible, you know, price for AD? When did they make the year the year? <laughs> right. And that's where it's even, that is academically variable. Because when, when they decided what was, would have been zero or one, we actually think it's probably four BC. It's weird to say that Jesus may have been born in 4 BC when you really look chronologically back at the timing of it. And I don't know the answer to that. I don't know when that, when that calendar was officially set and changed. And did, does anybody know that answer about the calendar? Rob? Rob? Yes. Uh, I yes. guess if Paul wasn't married, dating should have been okay. <laughs> <laughs> not according to Paul. He was, he was, he said no. Uh, he was tell not him, dating. Tell him to get to chapter three. Yeah, that's right. Um, we think this letter was written to a house church. There weren't separate buildings. Ecclesia or that type of thing, gathering is sort of what that means. You can gather in a park, you can gather in a home, and eventually separate structures were built for that, maybe because of size and other things like that. We think it was written primarily to a Gentile group, but as we read through Colossians, we'll see there is a pretty clear reference to circumcision, and almost in referring to that, they're referring to the Jewish tradition of circumcision. So either it was widely known in Gentile circles or there were more Jews here than we realize. He does make reference at the end of his letter to three people who are Jews who are with him. So it's clear in the churches growing up that you had people who have Jewish descent and people of Gentile descent. And one of the things going on in early church, not a problem here yet, it's not the content of the letter, is how those two mesh together with these different traditions. The further away you get from Jerusalem, the less an issue it is. But in Jerusalem and the Holy Land, it was and is still an issue. So well, let's talk a little bit about why the letter was written. Oh, got a question. Yeah, amazing. I just wanted, um, when did you say Paul was born? And... In we think six, about 6 AD, 6. And this letter some was... Scholars say six, some scholars say even but he was older than Jesus, but some others say he was younger than Jesus. We just don't know. But if this letter was written in 60... Um, right. And when did, they, when did they think... He would have been 54. Died? He would have been my age. He would have been 54. Yeah. <laughs> when he, I'm um, sorry, go ahead. And when did he die? 64 to 67 somewhere in there okay i'm just trying to get uh. right yeah and i wish I, the whole thing i wish were more precise that we knew a date yeah for all that um so that was considered an old man by this time um I, I certainly certainly older than normal So um, why is it written? It, he couldn't get there himself. He's trying to send them a message. It's a speech. He is trying to make his point to them. Um, and as you know, Paul, one of the things he did, some of his arguments were very legalistic sounding, like he's, in, he's defending, a, making his case, defending Bless a point, you. or making a, making a point to do things. And part of what he's doing in this, he's writing it as a warning to them. You're slipping. Your faith is becoming intermixed with other things, superstitions, other faiths, and it, it, you really need to stay pure. This is the Pharisee in him coming out in the sense of, of, of keeping things pure. He says in the letter of two different occasions, he's in chains. So that's why we know he can't come in person. And the writer wants the Colossians to stay true, to resist false teachings, False teachings having to do with visions about angels, 
the worship of angels, fasting to deprive one's body to get into the state where you could have a vision, some type of false humility, and one of the things that was growing in this world, Gnosticism, secret knowledge. I know you've heard this from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, but there's something else. It's a secret. <laughs> and only when you're good enough or smart enough or have the wisdom, then you'll, then you'll really be a Christian. And Paul is saying, no. Everything we need to know about Christ, we know about Christ. There is no secret knowledge. And when we in our ordination vows say that Holy Scriptures are the word of God and they contain all things necessary for salvation, one of the things that's doing is saying there is no secret knowledge out there. There's no Da Vinci Code at play where something happened afterwards and Mary Magdalene birthed the son. Of, there's none of that stuff. There's no secret knowledge out there. But everyone wanted to have the, the, the secret knowledge that is going on. Conspiracy theories abounded even then. Um, you will read some verses. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. That was a very important role that those early teachers had to play to keep the, the gospel pure. Because it's so easy for people to get into humanism and, and you know, the, the human mind sees things in such different ways. And That's they right. had to protect it until it was written right. down. And so. Well, even after it was written down, the creed is basically, again, written to combat heresy. Yeah. People were saying certain things about Jesus. He, he was really just very human. Or some were saying he was so divine, he was just like a ghost. And they said, no, he's fully human. He's fully divine. That's all the same. And the creed tries to spell that out about the nature of God and the nature of Christ and the nature of the Holy Spirit. So that's part of the heresies there. And this is not the only time that Paul has to go somewhere and say, don't believe there's a false teacher. Oh, they're super apostles. They say there's something. No, they're no more super. Here is the gospel. Don't let anybody change. If I come back and start preaching something different, then I've been taken to remember the purity of this message. Keep it clear. Keep it simple. The gospel of Christ. There's something too in here about asceticism. Instead of do not handle something, do not touch something, do not taste something. Um, because of, Im of impurity kind of thing. So we, it's hard to reconstruct exactly what Paul is refuting. As he writes this letter, we hear the sort of the second hand story. You know, when there's a fight, there's a first punch and a second punch. If you don't see the first punch, you got to figure out what the second punch is about. And that's what part of what this is, is figuring out what the, what the, the comeback is to this. And essentially, what Paul is saying is Jesus is the source of all treasures. He uses that language. That's chapter two, verse three. Jesus is the place of all treasures. In him is everything. And this great hymn that is sort of inserted at the end of chapter one um, talks about that. It talks about Christ in very important ways that sort of match the gospel of John in terms of Jesus's, even his pre-existence. All things are made through him and all things are made in him. So that doesn't say he was just came into being at that moment, whether it was 3 AD or 0, Jesus has always been a being. And that echoes what the Gospel of John is saying, different, different author. Um, one of the things, and again, this is a term, syncretism, where religions blend together or cultural things blend together. I'll give you an example. How do we determine the date of Christmas? It's Saturnalia from the Romans. From the Romans. Saturnalia. Saturnalia. It was the feast day of some, of some other, who was it on the Saturn's feast day or something like that? El Sol. El Sol. So that was, the, that was the feast day, December 25th. And the Christians said, nope, you know, we're going to take that date. <laughs> It's not in the Bible. His being born is in the Bible, but it's nothing about December 25th. We're going to take that date. Well, sometimes the culture would try to do that back. Like, let's put the Easter bunny into Easter. Yeah. 
Oh, why don't we have an Easter egg hunt in church? It's so cute to have the Easter bunny run. There's no Easter bunny in the Bible. That's why we don't have an Easter egg hunt at the church. And we and Christmas and Santa Claus. That's why Santa Claus doesn't come on Christmas Eve to a church. He can come to your house. But if we get to be where it's all about Santa Claus and not about, that's why Jews can have a great time at Walmart doing Christmas because it's all about gifts and stuff. It's not about Jesus. It's about Santa Claus. When, when, did, when did we take December 5th? What, what year was that? I don't know. It was probably in that same range. It was the uh, Saturnalia. Right, we were just talking Roman about Roman history or Roman practice. And so when the church in Rome decided to take over everything and be in charge. What year is that, though? Well, who knows? Well, that's what she's asking. Yeah, probably yeah. a few hundred years after the... Yeah, that's what she was. We talked about the Saturnalia thing when you were out. So we, that we, we got that part. She was just asking the date. For what it was, Rob. Yeah. Well, it's amazing. Always amazing to me, though, that Hanukkah coincides so very often, right when Christmas celebration is. Passover is and is usually within a few weeks of Easter, and the dates always seem to fall very close together, as if by the something a little bit by the Jewish calendar then or where the people were used to celebrating things at that point of time. Sure. And the Passover makes sense, right? Biblically, these were Jews and Jesus and his disciples were celebrating the Passover. And so that is pretty existent. Hanukkah. Yeah. Hanukkah comes and that's in that apocrypha time in lighting Maccabees. the candles and the oil doesn't go out and the Maccabees and all that kind of thing. And that, that's more of a timing thing with them. Yeah, I don't think it's trying to push Christmas out, but it's it's no, the time it, when they're when they're celebrating. They're, they do the same time, the dates. Right. So, the the point I'm trying to make is sometimes culturally or religiously, uh, something new starts coming in and it pushes the other thing out or makes it less important, and that is part of what the author of Colossians is writing to these people about. You've got some false teachings, say for the Episcopal church, it's swinging incense or having vestments or whatever else. What if that becomes, what if incense becomes more important than Eucharist? What if incense becomes more important than baptism? You've, you've set up false standards or, or false things. So don't, don't let the secondary or tertiary things in the life of the church become preeminent christ is all in all so that's a that's a little bit of an overstatement but that's part of what paul is saying is don't let these festivals don't let this what you can and can't touch don't let you think about the second knowledge or worshiping angels worshiping angels is secondary if it even is something that should be done at all jesus is who is to be worshiped amazing those it, those things would be so easily, um, I mean, so much, so difficult to get rid of in those early days because it was a lot of it was holdovers from Ju Judaism, you know, the the food taboo, taboos and and I mean, uh, was when Peter who was given the vision of the sheet with all the things that are okay to eat, but those yes. yeah. deeply entrenched in most of those people at the time those. Right. Of course. So yeah. And that's actually the opposite. That's old traditions through the power of the spirit are being pushed aside. Like circumcision, Paul's point is, is being circumcised. He's not worried about the circumcision of the flesh anymore. He's working, worried about the circumcision of the, of the soul, mm -hmm. of the being that's in a person. So the fleshly piece is, is not important. So it, it happens both ways in all of this. Since we're close to time here, let me just speed through the rest of my notes so we can get through to chapter one for next time. You'll have a lot of people, a lot of other biblical people mentioned in this letter. Timothy already has been, Ephraphras, so we've talked about a teacher and a friend. Mark, uh, potentially the one who wrote this gospel, who's the cousin of Barnabas. Jesus, Justice, who is Jewish. Luke, the good doctor, again, a gospeler. So it's interesting that Mark and Luke both mentioned here in this letter as being part of the church. 
a Demas, Nympha, a woman. Uh, there's a church in her house. Her name is Nympha, Archippus, Titus, Tychicus, Onesimus, and Aristarchus, who is a fellow, fellow prisoner. All those names will come up in reading this letter. So you can see there is a great cohort of people working with Paul, traveling with Paul. They get their role is sort of underplayed probably in Christianity, but they were very important missionaries, very important workers in the kingdom at that point. So real quickly, some other themes and topics, and I'll start off with this next year. One of the things that Paul is regularly doing is vouching for himself. I am truly an apostle. I know I wasn't one of the 12, but I am an apostle, and I was chosen, and I was favored. And so you should be listening to me rather than some of these other people who don't have the credentials that I have. So that's a little bit of what's in this letter. Uh, a bigger word, Christology, what we think of Christ is part of what's here. And this is a very high Christology that comes in this letter when we get to this part in chapter one. Another part, another theme is union with Christ. Or even in the words of this letter, being clothed in Christ. How are we in Christ? Will we get in, in, his, in his clothing? Like the phrase, a wolf in sheep's clothing. Not a good thing. But we want to be in Christ's clothing, and that is a good thing. The importance of prayer is throughout this letter. It starts talking about prayer. It ends talking about prayer. Prayer, 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 prayer. Prayer for each other. Very important. The three things that Paul ends up talking about in Romans, faith, hope, and love, in particular at the beginning of this letter, are all woven into that. Not in such beautiful ways as he does in 1 Corinthians 13, but faith, hope, and love are there. A theme in the New Testament, being strong, enduring to the end, is there. And also redemption, the forgiveness of sins, is here. And as we get towards the end, he's very hopeful for certain parts of, hum of Christian behavior. He has a whole list of things we're to put aside, anger, bad thinking, and a whole list of things we are to pick up and do so the ethical behavior we've been saved now what how are we to behave and then of course there are some tricky parts about slaves and masters there's some tricky parts for some about wives and husbands and children and who you're supposed to obey and what you're supposed to do and all those other kind of things <laughs> so we'll, we'll get to that part of the letter too but look for those themes Again, it takes, what, 10 or 15 minutes to read this whole letter. And so I would just suggest in tar terms of this class to really getting to know it, read it twice a week. Just sit down with a cup of coffee or a sometime and read Colossians, the whole thing, twice a week. That's probably more important than reading the book. But for next week in the book, at least read the, the parts up to about chapter 1 which will take you to page, 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 I'm getting there, 161. So 141 to 161 would be next week, those 20 pages. Any final questions before we sign off? And then next week we'll get into really the, the parts of the letter itself. Rob, would you recommend in our reading these things twice to read one of our favorite versions plus then the N.T. Wright translation? Yeah, sure. Why not? That's a good idea. Just to, to keep in mind that the, the English translation, whatever it is, is imperfect. And there are other ways to look at it and read at it that maybe help us to, to open up what the Holy Spirit is saying for us. Thank you for doing this for us. We appreciate it. You're welcome. You. I, I love being able to do it. I love having a good group on the screen. I love having a good group in the room. And uh, I hope this format works. When we get internet better, hopefully we can do it on the TV where you can look at it, everybody a little bit better. But I, um, I hope this worked well enough and we'll continue this way. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thank you. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you. You're very welcome. And I'd like to support.